Well, like Mecca said, thanks very much for coming to the, uh, the hangover shift as uh, this has been dubbed by my team. We really appreciate it and welcome. Um, so we're going to be talking... We're going to be talking about making money or how to make money on Google Play. Um, so Google Play is this gigantic digital marketplace. So Android has way over a billion users, soon there'll be two billion, even more users. And Google Play is how those users get software and content. So we actually, we view that as a very, very important responsibility. And the way that we make that possible is we've built this marketplace platform. So that's how we get all this, this to those users. Um, and for a marketplace, you need transactions, and that's what we three work on. So we make the Google Play commerce platform happen. So basically, you can think of our job as to make developers like yourselves successful. We want everyone to be successful selling content and uh, software on Google Play. So I'm Alistair Potts. Uh, I lead product for the Google Play commerce platform. Uh, I've been a retail guy all my life. I started off in South Africa where I grew up, uh, more recently at Zappos.com and at Amazon. Um, and I've been at Google for like three years now, and I absolutely love it. I'll let the other two introduce themselves. Hi, everyone. My name is Mecca, and I'm the engineering leader for Google Play Commerce. Uh, I've been at Google about three years, and before that, I was at Amazon also, a uh, big uh, retail commerce nerd. Uh, there I built a little thing called the Amazon App Store. Uh, and before that, uh, I was an app developer. Uh, I had a company that built a lot of uh, mobile apps. Uh, probably the one that you've heard of most is Zagat2Go. So yeah, that's me. Hi, everyone. My name is Tamsin Taylor. And I'm the Partner Development Manager at Google Play. My background is all mobile content. I've been building and uh, making money out of mobile products for about 15 years. Cool. Thanks very much. So the commerce platform. Uh, one of our biggest strategic pal pillars is reach. Like we have this vision that every single person on earth should be able to transact easily on Google Play. Uh, basically, how do we bring this gigantic, gigantic audience or market to, to you, the app developers? Uh, we have a big team working on this. This team wakes up every single morning. They're out there right now thinking about how we can achieve this vision. Uh, one of the best things that we can do is support local forms of payment. So we've got this gigantic marketplace, way over 140 countries. Uh, way over a billion users potentially and the fact of the matter is many of them just don't have access to credit cards so credit card support is great but it's just nowhere near enough and so local forms of payment is a huge deal for us and we have a large team working on this around the world very regularly we're launching new forms of payment in countries so what is an example of that so direct carrier billing is a great example of that we call it DCB giving users the ability to make purchases in apps buy those gems and put it onto your carryable is a huge huge deal for us so the, the chart on the right there is uh, showing what happened one, when we launched uh, direct carrier billing in Indonesia. We didn't even have all the carriers in Indonesia at that time. But you can see buyer growth was great. Like we were always growing our buyer base. But as soon as we launched a local form of payment other than cards in a country where credit cards are not widely used, buyer growth went up 4x. And this is something that we see over and over and over. We recently in Turkey, Saudi Arabia, all sorts of countries where credit card penetration is low, launching direct carry billing and other local FOPs does a huge deal for the business. Um, I always think this, and I, I recommend speak to your, your BD partner. If there's a country that you really care about, like if you're massive in Indonesia, make sure that you know when this happens so you can take advantage of those spikes in buyer growth. So DCB is important to us. So I'm actually really, really proud to say that we well, we fairly recently crossed over the 100 carrier partnerships bar uh, barrier, and we're actually just carried right on going. We're at 105 carrier partnerships around the world in 41 countries. And un unbelievably, that means more than 600 million, actually quite a lot more than 600 million active devices have access to direct carrier billing. So it's like a one tap or a few tap to set up a form of payment on Google Play. This is a huge job. We have a big team working with carriers, setting up the deals, maintaining the deals, working around the world. But as you can see from the previous slide, this is totally worth it. So we, the, the buyer reach team is always out there adding more direct carrier billing. Another great form of payment is the play gift cards business. So I always talk to people about gift cards and say it's like the magical form of payment because it gives the users the ability to use whatever form of payment they like. The big one is cash. So Every single day, every single moment, we have people walking into like a 7-Eleven in Tokyo or a corner store in Indonesia, handing over cash and getting play balance back and then using that in your apps. Uh, it's a huge deal for us. It's also a huge operation. There's a, like physical retail. There's a lot of regulation around this stuff. We've got a big gift cards team, and they do great work. 
over 500,000, actually way over 500,000 locations uh, have Play gift cards available to them. So, you know, almost anywhere in Brazil you can walk around and get a uh, Play gift card if you want. So we're constantly like working to bring more reach. We actually have a big team that works on this stuff. They're working with banks, they're working with carriers, they're working with specific local forms of payment in all sorts of countries. It's a huge, a huge job, but we're, we're, we take it extremely seriously. And we've got some really cool local forms of payments coming in India, in the Netherlands, in Germany, in Korea, and in other places in the future. This is something that we, we care deeply about, we invest deeply. This is how we can bring reach to yourselves and the rest of the developers. And then lastly, I should say that one of the great things you get on the Google Play platform or the commerce platform is that we already have a lot of buyers. So somebody has gone along and added a form of payment, added their card, and activated DCB, become comfortable transacting in apps on other apps, and we've got a huge base of these people. And then those, they have become much easier for you to convert in your own apps. So people who have already made purchases are correlated with a 40 times, actually way over 40 times conversion rate compared to those who have not purchased in the past. So this is an extremely attractive thing for developers in the platform. The other thing that lands up happening is we keep these buyers active. They, their card expires and we make sure that they renew their card or they, DC, they change carrier and we get them on the new carrier billing. Uh, so this is also a very big deal for developers such as yourself. But it's not all about reach, reach is fantastic, fantastic, but there's also a lot of optimization and iteration that goes into this. I'm gonna hand over to my mate Mecca and he's gonna tell you a little bit more about it. Thanks, Alistair. So, Alistair's right, reach is fantastic. So, your customers can buy your products in over 145 different countries around the world. And coverage is great too. So, Coverage is talking about the different forms of payment, the different ways that customers can buy your products. But reach and coverage alone are not enough. We want to optimize the purchase experience so that every one of your customers has the best possible purchase experience wherever they happen to be around the globe. So Google Play is a global commerce platform. And that's something that I want you to really internalize. Most of the customers, most of the opportunity for purchasing your apps and your products is gonna exist outside of the country that your app is being developed in. So I wanna to talk to you a little bit about the way that we think about optimization. Now, we think about it as applied effort over time. We are constantly improving the platform. So Google Play obviously is a very widely distributed app over a billion users. We push out new changes and improvements to the purchase flow every single month. Now our backend systems, we upgrade every single week. Parts of our backend system are upgraded every single day. The system is always learning. It's always improving. And what that means for you as a developer is that's how we fulfill the promise from last year to this year that our purchase flow is a little bit faster converts a little bit better and is a little bit more available. And so this is what we do for the platform on your behalf. Writing code is fun. Not writing code and getting the same result, also fun. Uh, deleting code, that's expert mode, but you know we'll talk about that later. So <clears throat> I wanna talk about a little model that we use to think about optimizing our purchase flow. And this works with your applications as well. Now, we think about commerce, obviously I love commerce, uh, but there are other ways to monetize in your application as well. This works for advertising, this works for purchases even outside of commerce, but this is the model that we use. We think about friction and motivation. Now, motivation is anything that gives your users incentive to make a purchase. So maybe you have a great content app and users want to subscribe to see that content, no Game of Thrones spoilers, um, and maybe you have a great game, right? And you have in-app items that the user would like to purchase to advance to the next level, right? All of these things are motivation. They give the user incentive to make a purchase. Now, friction is anything that can stop that purchase from happening. In fact, friction is also anything that can even slow that purchase down. Now, some friction is really obvious. If the form of payment that the user wants to use is not available, well, then they can't make that purchase. That's why gift cards are so important. A little bit less subtle, or a little bit more subtle, is things like the number of clicks, or the number of screens that a user has to go through. Yeah, that would make sense. Less clicks, fewer screens, improves conversion. Now, latency 
and network connectivity errors. Again, thinking about a global commerce platform. These ones are really important. Now, we're here in Mountain View, inches away from Google headquarters. Our 4G coverage is awesome. And our Wi-Fi is unlimited and unmetered. This is just not the case for most of your customers around the globe, right? So improvements in latency and conversion have a small impact here in the developed world, but in countries like Brazil, India, Indonesia has a huge uplift just by making your applications more resilient to adverse network situations. Another even more subtle one I want to talk about is cognitive load. That's a fancy way of saying, how much do I have to think before making a purchase? The answer should be, not much. So things that interfere with this, things that increase cognitive load, are more information on the screen than is needed to complete the purchase. We want to keep the screens as simple as possible, yet we want the customer to be fully informed when they make a purchase. Commerce is a trust relationship. You give me money, I give you stuff. And if that works out well, we do this again, right? Commerce, to work well, is a long-term trust relationship. So you want the user to have the information to be informed, but you don't want to give them more information than they need. And the way you solve that is with good design. Design matters. So what I mean is for the UX designers out there, moving pixels around does actually drive up revenue. Now pricing, pricing of, uh, you know, is a huge form of friction that a lot of people don't think about. And this is another one that I want you to take very seriously, and we're gonna talk about this in detail later. I saw the Android Auto Maserati. I, I want a Maserati, who doesn't want a Maserati? That price point is causing me some friction, right? <laughs> um, and so having items priced at the right point really helps your users to convert. And we're, we're gonna go into some, some examples. Tamsin's gonna help us with that. Pricing stuff is hard, but Tamsin's amazing, so it'll, it'll all work out. Localizing the purchase flow is something that we do and something that you can do in your apps. And it's easy to say, oh, I don't know all the local markets. I, I don't know how to make my app work there. But some things are incredibly simple. So something as simple as in the United States, we like to buy stuff with credit cards. In some countries, they like to buy things with bank transfer. In other countries, they like to buy things on their carrier bill. So solving the friction point of enabling customers to purchase, that problem is solved in different ways with different markets. Now that's looking at location as one dimension, but there are many dimensions. Now, everything we've talked about so far, we've talked about the reach, we've talked about the coverage, these are all things that we're doing. And it would be great if you didn't have to do anything and everything would just work, but, um, you know, this is, the purchase flow doesn't begin with Google. The motivation doesn't begin with Google. It begins with your apps and your customers. And there are some things that you can really be optimizing as well. We're gonna go into what some of those examples are. And again, this is for commerce in general, right? These are commerce fundamentals. So, I wanna talk a little bit about Rocket Internet. Rocket Internet is a global scale company and they have over 100 applications. One of their applications is a food delivery app. And in this food delivery app, they analyze their users. They looked at 60 dimensions, location being just one of them. They also looked at session length, cart size, what products the customers were ordering. They used Google Analytics to do this. They loaded it up using BigQuery and analyzed it. And what they saw was that the users kind of broke down into five clusters. The top two clusters, which contain just 5% of their users, drove 40% of their revenue, right? So, you know, you think Pareto principle, okay, well then let's student body left. Let's just throw everyone on the, the high value users and kind of focus there. Well, not quite, right? The bottom 95%, again, that represents your opportunity. That represents your growth. That's where your scale comes from. So what Rocket did is they divided their team in half. Half of the team focused on high value users and half of the team focused on the users who are not yet high value. And what they saw is even looking at the high value users, they saw something interesting. They saw that these two cohorts behave differently, right? You think your most engaged users are your highest value, the ones with the long session times, and that's not what they saw. 
what they saw was that their most high value customers had extremely short session times. They were getting in, they knew the app, they, they ordered what they want and they got out. Now, they had a very high completion rate of orders, right? hence why the revenue was high, but they weren't spending long in the app. So optimizing for them means something different. Optimizing for them means adding a one-click checkout, making that fast session even faster. I don't know if they're allowed to say one-click checkout, maybe it's less than two-click checkout. Um, but so then they looked at the other cohort, the other high-value user cohort, and what they saw is that these users were doing a lot of repeat ordering, right? They were coming in and they were spending a lot of time in the order just making the same order that they made last time. So optimizing for them meant putting something, hey, here's that curry bowl you ordered last week. Would you like to order it again, right? So this is, when you think about optimizing, think about optimizing along many dimensions. There's lots of different toys. In this case, they use Google Analytics and BigQuery. But there's lots of different ways to do this. I saw some really amazing stuff from Firebase uh, here at I.O. I don't know if you guys caught some of those sessions. Uh, the Play Store, we have a lot of really great tools. And some of you are building some really interesting uh, things. AppTentive is doing some interesting things. So there's lots of different ways to do this. But the key point is you should be doing it. And then looking at these users who are not in the top 95%, what they saw was that when they dug into this, 84% of those users which were falling off on the home screen. They weren't getting any further than the home screen, right? Why, right? So they start digging into this. They started doing UX experimentation, right? They started reducing the amount of information you needed to provide just to get started. Again, providing too much data, that's another form of friction. I don't wanna fill out a form just so I can see if your food delivery app is good, right? So these, this, is what, this is what I want you all to be thinking about when you think about optimizing your app. Now, another example is optimizing your business model. How do you monetize? Like the simple days used to be, oh, you got free apps and then buy my paid app. That wasn't very great. Then we're sort of in today's world where it's, okay, we've got the free app and you've got in-app items or subscriptions, right? But or maybe you add supported. But I want you to start thinking about using these different monetization mechanisms in combination. So Lovu uh, is a dating app. Is anyone familiar with Lovu? Am I saying that right, Lovu? I was wondering <laughs> if I'm saying it right. Um, and so there's really two different types of dating apps. There's ones that are really trying to develop long-term connections, and those tend to be subscription type apps. And then there are ones that are much more casual, right? You know, swipe left, swipe right, that kind of thing. And those tend to use in-app uh, billing items. So you, know, you can buy super likes or a, oh dear God, what have I done? No, 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 but like, you know, this, this type of thing. What Lavu noticed was that they could combine these two things to get a good result. Because the casual daters were very unlikely to subscribe. Right? So what they did was they said, well, let's offer both. Let's offer subscription for people looking for long-term connection. And let's offer in-app items for people looking for casual dating. And that worked. They were able to monetize these customers that they weren't able to monetize before. But something amazing happened. They noticed that over time, the casual daters, 10% of them, subscribed and became higher ARPU, long-term connection customers. This, this gives me hope, right? People, a lot of people really do want long-term connection with other human beings. It's not all about just hooking up, right? So this is interesting. Think about the different models that you can use to monetize your app. Now, we have a promotions team on Google Play that builds promotions for customers. Things like discount codes, coupons, that kind of thing. The mission of that team is the right offer for the right user in the right context at scale. Now, underwater apps, I don't know how, like what's going on here, but they get that mission crystally clear. They've implemented this in their own app. So what they do, again, they combine advertising and in-app purchase items. But what they do is they use the player stats API to understand the behavior of their users. Which users are they going to monetize through advertising? Which users are they going to monetize through in-app purchasing? 
again, in the old days, it used to be get my free version, it has ads, get my paid version, and or upgrade to freemium, it has no ads. But why make the user have to make that conscious choice? Why raise the cognitive load? How do you bring that down? We bring it down by analyzing the data and making that under and getting that understanding without the user having to tell you anything. So they were able to predict which users were likely to spend. Now, what did they do with this data? The users that were likely to spend, they decided not to show those users ads. And what they saw was that revenue went up by 15%. Don't show ads to the customers who are about to spend. And again, you don't have to ask the users for this. You can understand this from looking at the data. They also did something else. For the users that were unlikely to ever spend in the app, normally for an in-app uh, purchase type app, that might be a wash. What they decided was to up the frequency of the ads so that when the users opened the, ad, every, uh, opened the app, every time they saw one ad, before it was something less than one. What they were able to see was they were able to increase the advertising revenue from those users by 17%. That's pretty awesome. And again, no, the user doesn't have to do anything. This is understanding your data, understanding your users deeply, and segmenting. Okay? So we've talked a lot about the different types of optimization. We've talked about reach and coverage. But pricing optimization is uh, its, its own topic, uh, I think is deserving of, of its own section. So Tamsin is going to help us with that. Thank you. Thanks, Mecca. <laughs> so Mecca and Alistair have just taken us through all of the things which we're doing to work so hard to make our Play Commerce platform make more money for you. So what I'm going to now talk about is I'm going to give you some examples of developers who've really taking advantage of, all of the platforms that we offer to make more money. In the next 10 minutes or so, I'll take you through some examples of uh, developers who use creativity, they've used localization, and they've, more importantly, used experimentation to increase revenue and conversion. So, Scopely is a fantastic American games application. I know there's someone in the audience today, so if you have any questions, you can hunt her down. Scopely uh, has over 50 million downloads uh, worldwide, and they are a role-playing and strategy game. Their recent game, as you can see in the screen, is The Walking Dead. Now, traditionally, RPG and strategy games, and I'm sure I don't need to tell you this, I'm sure you people know, uh, are monetized through in-app purchasing. But Scopely had a challenge. How can they increase retention and new users? So why is this important for Scopely? Well, when you think about an RPG strategy game, it's really important to build an ecosystem of, pl ecosystem of players, right? So that you can create a team and battle it, out, battle it out against each other. Who here plays RPG games? I would expect it from you, Philip. Good, yes. Excellent. So, so what, what, how do they approach this challenge? Well, because they're great users of the Google Play platform, they came up with an innovative monetization technique. They introduced a 30-day pass OK. So the really great thing about this pass was when you downloaded it, when you bought it, you got an instant 270 coins. OK, so what? But then, here's the kicker. Every time you came back into the game on a daily basis, within that 30-day period, you got an additional 70 coins. So in effect, what they're doing is incentivizing users to come back and play the game and grow that ecosystem. So they combined subscription with in-app purchases to really grow retention. But that's not all. What they found, which was really surprising to them, was that their new users and non-paying users increased. What they saw was that one third of all their purchases of this pack were brand new users. And two thirds of those were non-payers, long-term non-payers. Now, did anyone see Mateo's talk on Wednesday OK, Philip again, good. Um, so I'd encourage you to have a look at that live stream when you go back home. But he goes into more detail about using data uh, to really understand your audience. But in game language, what I've been told by Scopely is that if a user doesn't actually spend money in the, between the first one and seven days, or really one and three, they're highly unlikely to ever spend any money. 
Now, the name of the game here, I think the presentation is called How to Make Money on Google Play. So, Scopely is a great example because what they've effectively done is unlock this long term, non paying base of users to create a whole new market. Now, unlocking new users and long term non spenders is important for everyone, wouldn't you agree? Yeah, everyone wants more money, more payers. And it's, no more, it's most important in emerging markets. Who here is from an emerging market? A few people. Excellent. Yeah, I'm from an emerging market as well. I'm Australian. <laughs> OK, so it is emerging. Um, <laughs> just no one knows about it yet. So um, DivMob is, is, a, is an example of one of our partners who really took advantage of um, of our new lower minimum price floors that we launched earlier this year. Now, as I mentioned, and Mecca mentioned, and Alistair mentioned, we're working really, really hard to increase more forms of payment in more countries so that people can buy from you. And we think it's really important because we want to unlock all these, these great users for you. So DivMob is a, is a great company. They're based in Vietnam, so no one knows more than they do how people in emerging markets have different abilities to pay. And they're a huge company. They've recently, I think they've had about 40 million downloads, and they've just launched their game, uh, Epic Heroes War, which just got nominated top developer and editor's choice. So with all this success, you think, fantastic, they're doing so well. Well, in fact, what they saw was that they had all these users in emerging markets. They just weren't buying. They weren't paying. And if you think about it, before we made the change, on the minimum price floor was 99 cents American. Now, if anyone is from Vietnam here, 99 cents, I checked it today, is 22,000 dong. That's the Vietnamese currency. Now, for 22,000 dong, you can get a really, really tasty lunch in Vietnam. How much would your lunch cost you today if you had to pay for it? Eight bucks, 10 bucks? Is that? Does that sound like something you'd pay as a minimum price to play a game? So put it in that, in that context. Now, DivMob were desperate to start testing because they had the data that backed up their, uh, their hypothesis that once you got someone just buying something, just paying something, you could actually grow, them, grow their ARPU through cross-selling, upgrading the game, and doing more of these kinds of things. So as soon as we uh, changed the, the system and allowed them to price lower than US, uh, 99 US cents. They started experimenting in Vietnam, uh, Thailand, Malaysia, Philippines, and the results were outstanding. They created an introductory pass at the minimum floor, and they saw a 300% increase in pay transactions. 300% increase. And best yet, they saw that their base of paying users tripled. And that was after the the blip of promotion, right? So we're talking about a consistent result. Furthermore, with all these new users who are pretty happy to now be able to, you know, get into the game, they saw a 17% increase in retention. So retention, monetization, all goes together. And the best part is that if you fast forward a couple of months, six out of 10 of their top transaction markets by volume of transactions, are now these sub-dollar price countries. So what this has done is really open up a huge new market for them, one which weren't paying before. Now, another fantastic company we love very much and is in the audience today is Animoca. So Animoca also were very, very keen to test sub-dollar pricing because they, again, they also knew they had all these customers in emerging markets who weren't paying, and this was a fantastic opportunity to try and move them along the ARPU ladder. Now, DivMob have over 400 apps live and over 430 million downloads to date. So they know something about testing and pricing. DivMob took a different approach, uh, sorry, Animoca took a different approach and created sachet pricing. Now, with these sachet prices, you could get 100 diamonds and 5,000 coins for the lowest minimum price in that country. And the way they structured it was quite interesting. This wasn't a regular price, it wasn't a regular skew. It was actually a promotional skew that was targeted to these users. 
And the way they promoted it was through native banners inside the app, so native billboards and posters. And they were very happy with the results. They saw that 90% of all buyers of the sachet prices were absolutely new buyers. And better yet, as Yusuf can confirm, 50% of all of those buyers went on to become repeat purchasers. And let me be clear, they weren't repeatedly buying the cheap option, they were repeatedly buying the full priced items. So you can see that what's happening here is you're getting new payers in and you're just taking them on the ARPU journey to increase their value. So this really has opened up new markets, increased retention and increased revenue for these partners. Now, work, using minimum prices can really help in emerging markets. But obviously, you've also got a mature markets to target, right? So SDN is one example of a, a games company you might be familiar with. They have over 700 million downloads across the world. And they're responsible for the franchises Juice Jam, Cookie Jam, and Panda Pop. They really thought that localizing pricing could really have a big impact in some markets. So they took their top markets and they used the Economist Big Mac Index and then they rounded those prices to the user's preferred country price format. Now let me break that down. So who here knows about the Big Mac Index? Cool, okay, for those of you who maybe are less familiar, um, the Big Mac Index is basically a, let's see, it's a bit of analysis that The Economist newspaper has done, whereas, thank you very much, um, and what it does is it shows you the comparative price of a McDonald's hamburger from America to, say, Vietnam. So you can really get a sense of, because Mac is, you know, they're pretty smart about these things. You can get a sense of what the price should be in that market. Now, when we talk about price formats, what we mean is that, you know, in some markets like Korea and Japan, they prefer whole rounded numbers. So instead of 653 yen, they prefer 700 yen. So rounded figures. Now, they tested in, uh, as I said, their top markets. And what they saw was quite interesting. They saw that in some markets, like Italy and Switzerland, ARPU increased as much as 78%. In other markets, they saw a neutral revenue impact, such as Korea and uh, Norway. But above, the, above all, across all of the countries they tested in, they saw a 30% increase in ARPU. They were, they were really happy with this because they, they kept wanting to do more testing. Um, and as a result, they've ro rolled these prices out to all of their apps and games. Now the lesson here is that, you know, a 10% increase or decrease in a certain country is not going to work for everyone. The lesson here is that we want you to test your prices in these different markets and see what works for your customers in those markets. Okay, so we've talked about uh, we've talked about games a lot, haven't we? We've talked about Scopely, DivMob, Animoca, SGN. But it's not just the games companies who are leading the innovation in pricing. One example of a, a great app company is Memrise. Memrise are a leading language learning application. The nature of their content, obviously, learning lots of languages, is that they're a global app. And they have a very large proportion of users from emerging markets. Now, they're a young company, so they only actually launched priced you know, propositions back in July 2015. They just launched uh, monthly and annual passes. So in August, they decided they'd try localizing prices. They used the BMI, the uh, Big Mac Index, again, and they saw reductions between 10 and 80% on their prices, depending on the country. What they found was some really good impacts in countries like Egypt, India, Mexico, Ukraine, Saudi Arabia. Above all, they saw a 46% in new subscribers. Now, we've talked a lot about localizing prices, which is great. But to back all this up, what's really important is to have an experimentation mindset. So I'm going to take you through a couple of examples of partners who do this extremely well. They've really thought long and hard about the way they present the price, what the price is, and then how it's formatted. Because the key here is about, uh, has anyone heard about psychological pricing? Okay, it's so basically, if anyone's been to a restaurant on a date, you know, you don't choose the cheapest wine, you choose the second cheapest wine. Shh, don't tell anyone. Um, 
And so this is the idea that you want to create this idea of value. You want to create a reference point in the user's mind so that they go, well, I'm, I, you know, I could get that lower price one and there's that expensive one, but that one in the middle looks really good. And so this is the kind of thing we're talking about here. Now, um, Peak is, a, is, an, is an excellent uh, app. They do, they're global leaders in brain training. And they know that they need to really listen to their users, continue to test and iterate to stay ahead of the competition. So what they did was they tested two different value propositions to see how they would impact conversion and revenue. The first they tested was how can they, similar to the ones we talked about earlier, how can they actually get non-payers to start paying? In this instance, they ran an A-B test where they said, what would happen if when the user gets to the point where they hit subscribe, instead they go, they, and they back out and they cancel. So what Peak Dart did was pre uh, present them a screen that said, oh, before you go, uh, we'll give you a 20% discount if you subscribe today. This actually resulted in a 25% increase in those people who saw the screen subscribing. So never say never. The second thing they tested was how to increase ARPU. Now, as I mentioned, or maybe I didn't mention, they had a monthly and an annual subscription. What they wanted to test was a lifetime subscription. So you and I just said about creating a reference point in people's mind and that sense of value. The lifetime subscription was three times the price of the annual subscription. But if you think about the kind of content it is, people have an altruistic view that they're going to really improve their brain. They're going to smash it out. What they found was that 10% now of all subscribers are lifetime subscribers. And here's the, the kicker. Um, I'm sure for you as app developers, cash flow is really important. Having this lifetime subscription has increased their return on acquisition cost by 30%. It's coming in 30% faster because they're getting more cash flow in quicker. So consider things like this when, you, when you're pricing. Memrise have also done some interesting stuff around psychological pricing. If anyone knows, we actually launched quarterly subscriptions in September last year. I was very excited. So Memrise already had monthly and annual subscriptions, and they, they were very keen to test quarterly. Again, you know, learning a language is a, an altruistic, you know, I really want to do it. It's a uh, self-fulfilling, enjoyable task. So what they found was that, that, well, first of all, they were a bit concerned that people would stop buying the annual and move to the quarterly. But what they found was that actually, the people who were usually buying the monthly started buying the quarterly and there was no cannibalization in the annual. And this resulted in a 72% lift in ARPU, plus they saw 33% more users. They also tested point in time messaging. So you know I talked about um, when Peak had that back out flow message? Memrise did a similar thing, but instead of targeting non-payers, Memrise was seeing if they could increase ARPU of existing subscribers. So they targeted uh, monthly and quarterly users, the subscribers, and when they're having a really good learning experience, when they're really smashing it out, winning all their, you know, their tests, Memrise will give them a, a call to action. Hey, you're doing so well. Why don't you just upgrade to the annual pass and save some money? And this resulted in a doubling of ARPU for those users. So Peak and Memrise are two really good examples of developers who really, really employ price experimentation to, to grow revenue and conversion. Now, the final uh, example I'll talk about is interesting because it's not about the price itself and it's not about reference pricing. It's about how do you describe the value that you're offering users for the cash you're asking for. Now, has anyone used Runtastic? Good, okay. So Runtastic have 17 apps live in the App Store. Uh, if you know, they started out as a premium offering and about a year and a half ago they moved to subscription model. So conversion's really important for them. Now, what they saw from their data was that people were dropping off on that final screen, on the final purchase screen. And they had a suspicion that maybe if they changed the way they presented the copy, that would have an impact. So the original screen had all the li features listed out in great detail. So what they tested was having just the one key feature called out in a cleaner, simpler screen. This resulted in a 103% lift in conversion. So you can see that testing different price propositions 
representations and descriptions can really increase conversion and revenue. So today we've covered uh, quite a bit. Uh, we've talked about how our goal in life is to make sure that every single Android user in the world can buy your content no matter where they are and what format they want to pay in. We've talked about how we want to remove all the friction from the payment flow. And we've given you some examples of developers who've used creativity and leveraged our platform in different ways to increase revenue. Now, one thing I want to call out, I know we mentioned analytics before, but all of the developers we talked about today use experimentation and data to drive their product pricing and proposition decisions. And they all think about how much can the users in different countries that I serve afford? Now, the Big Mac index is free. You can go and have a look at it today, no problem. So I'd really encourage you to, to consider these things we've talked about today and apply them to your own app because I, mean, I can speak on behalf of these guys. We're so excited to see what you'll do next. Thank you.